So next up, I'm happy to introduce uh, Sonny Rivera, who is going to give us a really great talk about uh, the intersection of barbecue data and Snowflake. Uh, Sonny is the Director of Data Delivery at a Alley F Financial, based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he is actually our user group leader, so he has volunteered to help us out with the Snowflake user group in Charlotte. Um, I think this is going to be a, a very exciting and uh, tasty presentation from Sonny. Take it away, Sonny. Thank you very much. Let me make sure I share my screen here. So everyone should be seeing my screen at this point. Yep, looks good. Let's see here. So uh, my name's Sonny Rivera and I'm in Charlotte. I'm really uh, honored to be here and to look at all the attendees around the world, right? Uh, I just kept seeing uh, participants coming up from all over the world, which is, is really exciting. Uh, I didn't think about that before the presentation. So let me jump right into uh, what we're going to talk about today, and which is really my challenge on um, making barbecue, right? So it's a manual process. It's a long process and might take, you know, 14 to 16 hours to do a good pork shoulder or, or a good Boston butt. So I needed to be able to predict a few things, right? Things like how long is it going to take to cook or what time do I need to get up at, in the middle of the night and refuel this while it's 30 degrees outside. So this is an old Danish proverb, right? It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. And if you're as old as I am, you remember it from Yogi Berra. So before we jump in, we'll learn a little bit about the history and the problem domain, right? So where I come from in the, in the deep South, right? The question is, is barbecue a uh, noun or a verb? Well, it's a noun, right? It's something you eat. If you're cooking, um, you're allowed to change that Q to a C and now it's a verb. Now you can barbecue something. Um, another nice note, while the, the Spaniards introduced pigs into North America in the 1600s, indigenous people were slow cooking meat over pits long before you know, Western Europeans arrived. So like a lot of great cultural aspects of today, they're really blended from so many different uh, areas around the world. Um, and and a, a kind of cool fact here in North Carolina is the courthouses and the county seats really gave rise to modern um, barbecue joints. In the Great Depression, um, what was still working? Well government was working, right? Courts, lawyers, judges, defendants, plaintiffs, juries, um, they were all at the courthouse. And so these entrepreneurs went out and they set up their wares outside of the county seats in the courthouses. Uh, it gave rise to a lot of the different uh, styles that we have today in barbecue, but it was a way for them to uh, make a living and sell, sell their wares. Like I said, it, it gave rise to a lot of different styles. Um, here in North Carolina, we've got a Eastern style and a Western style, a whole hog style where they do the entire animal. Um, and then on the Western side, they tend to do the shoulders and the, the, the ribs. In South Carolina, um, it's a mustard style sauce, right? And they still have the whole hog, the whole hog side versus the shoulder side. Um, out in Memphis, which is a style that I do. Um, we tend to do ribs, we tend to do pork shoulders, um, and we put a, a dry rub on there with sugar and cayenne pepper. This is really good and creates a really tasty bark, right? So I tend to follow what Thomas Jefferson said when it comes to this. Is in matters of style, you swim with the current. Uh, I, I don't know that any of these are better than the others. I just love them all. I try them all. Um, and I would encourage you to do the same thing. So you may be asking yourself, what does any of this have to do with data? And, and we will get to that shortly. Um, but 
what makes barbecue really, really good, right? There's a couple of things. The moist, the, the meat has to be moist. It's got to be moist and tender. Um, there's a good smoke ring, probably maybe in the outer layer is probably a half inch and it's red and, and brown. And that's where all the smoke flavor collects. The inside is brown and moist. And then there's a nice flavorful bark around this. So I kind of follow Otis Redding when it comes to this and make sure that it's tender. Um, the other thing I didn't tell you about uh, what Thomas Jefferson said, or the second part of that quotation is, in matters of principle, you stand like a rock. And so there are some of these principles when it comes to making barbecue. You've got to cook it low, and you've got to cook it slow, right? The end product needs to be tender, moist, and juicy. Otherwise, what you've created is something we call, um, you might be familiar with it, we call it leather, right? So and then the last thing that we, um, we, we know, the tools you use, the ingredients you use matter. So good woods, oak, pecan, hickory, apple, cherry. I tend to use a lot of oak myself. Um, I've got these 150 year old oak trees in my yard and, and some old pecan trees around. So those are some of the flavors that I like and they're local, they're familiar. Um, so they taste really good, right? So I wanted to give you a sense of what the, uh, the principles in practice look like. This photo on the left is what it looks like at my house when I do a barbecue. I literally sleep outside with my smoker. Um, and that's because we care so much about the quality of the food. And if you're going to do barbecue in North Carolina, kind of the, the home of barbecue, um, you better bring it pretty strong. So uh, I, I will literally sleep outside, check the smoker. And I, I'll, I'll say, until I got this IoT thermometer, right? This IoT thermometer that would actually stream off data every minute about what's the temperature of my smoker and what's the temperature of the meat. So the other one might be if you were to look at the, uh, the photo on the right, and this is not me, uh, a friend of mine does a winter cook, had a lot of snow, but was committed to doing his winter cook. Uh, and that's the type of dedication you see with folks that do barbecue. But this is why we do it, right? So we get tender, juicy ribs that just fall off the bone. We get this nice pork butt or a, a pork shoulder that pulls apart easily. Um, this is why we do it. I will tell you, I've been, you know, uh, accused of being a little bit of a, a barbecue fanatic, and I want to dispel the rumor now that my son, whose name is Robert Quentin, I did not name him Robert Quentin, so I could call him Bobby Q for short. So that's put to bed, it's out in public now. So as we move forward, I'll tell you a little bit more about how smokers work, right? So if you take a look at, you know, at the photo on the right, um, airflow is everything. So airflow controls the temperature, essentially. How much air you're pumping through will drive the temperature up. These IoT thermometers, they will test the chamber inside the smoker. You can also have, say, an additional probe in the meat. And then they'll drive this fan right down here to say, okay, the temperature's low, let me push some more air in. And what comes out the top, not represented in this diagram, a little vent, maybe you can control how big or how small that vent opening is. What comes out of the top is the air pressure plus excess smoke and really good smells, right? So the coals burn slowly. And, and the way I do it is I usually start with some coals, charcoal, Kingsford, um, but then I use wood throughout the rest of the, the, the smoking process. There's usually a water pan right around here and it keeps the heat from going directly on the meat. It goes up and around, 
kind of keeps the temperature more, uh, the temperature stable, and it keeps um, your meat from having direct heat. So here's a quick little temperature profile that I tend to use. I will heat up my smoker to 300. I'll put the meat on around this time, so we're up 270, uh, and then I'll let it run it at 270 for a while. I'll, we'll run at 250, and then we'll run at 230. And so with my IoT thermometer controlling the airflow and controlling the temperature, the, the uh, temp looks something like this, right? Nice and stable. There's a little something going on here. Still, I change the temperature down. Looks good. A little something going on here. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is your typical profile. This might be a profile of, well, it might be, it actually is the profile of a cook that I did. This is a pork butt and what the temperature looks like. And you could see started roughly 7 p.m. It finishes 7 a.m. So we're talking 12 hours to do this cook, right? But to the keen eye, something interesting is going on right here, right? Look at the tangent, look at this line right here. We're increasing at the rate of about 25 degrees an hour. Well, oh, when we get up here, say four, four hours in, we're down to five degrees per hour. And we stay at that long, slow rate, right? I'm trying to get to say 190 degrees right up here. I'm at 150, so that's 40 degrees. At five degrees an hour, it's gonna take me eight hours. And sure enough, this is, you know, about 11 p.m. and we're going to pull it off at 7. So that's a long, slow cook. But I, you need to ask yourself what's happening during this period, right? This is where your meat is cooking really slow, right? Um, the, the, the meat is probably 70% water by weight, and you'll lose 25% of that during the cook process. You don't want to lose a lot more than that. Otherwise, you end up with, again, leather. Um, there's connective tissues in there, right? Well, if you cook those fast, they just knot up like a, a ball of rubber bands and you get really tough meat. But if you cook them really slow and at a low temperature, they spread out, they absorb water, they retain moisture, and they break apart and they become very, very soft, right? Then we have um, the meat itself that continues to cook and fats, and fats render, but they render way out here at say 180 degrees. In other words, they melt. And so you need to run your barbecue for a while at 180 degrees. So that's what's happening during the cook process. And this is called, this, you know, this process is called the stall, that really long cook that's out there. So other folks begin to ask, well, is there a profile where it just continues to, to cook and power on through at that 25 degrees per hour rate and I'd be done sooner? Um, is there a profile like that? Is there something I could do? And it turns out that sure enough, there is. And, and the folks in Texas will know this, right? It's something called the Texas crutch. Um, and this is also say uh, a wrap. We'll take the, the meat out of the smoker We'll wrap it in foil, wrap it really tight, um, put our probe back in, and we'll put it back in, let it cook. So one thing that happens is, I'll look back at this profile for a second. One thing that happens during this profile, what's happening, I told you that it's at five degrees per hour, but what's actually happening, why is it slowed down? Why is that happening? Well, that's what we call the um, evaporative effect. Right, so that's similar to when you go for a run and you're sweating, right? That, that moisture is cooling you off. The sweat on your skin, the moisture on your skin evaporating is cooling you off. It's the same feeling you get when you get out of a hot shower and it feels cool, that evaporative effect. That's what's happening in our cook. So the evaporation of that water is cooling the meat and keeping the temperature down. Again, if we lose that, uh, if we let out too much uh, moisture, the temperature would rise and go, go skyrocketing, right? So in this particular case, we've wrapped it and we're trying to achieve that. We want it to, 
the temperature to, to continue to rise, um, but we don't want it to dry out, so we've wrapped it. Well, this is equivalent to going for that same run, but doing it inside of a raincoat, right? You still sweat, but you're not gonna cool off. So you're gonna continue to get warmer and warmer, and that's exactly what we see here. I'll walk over a couple of these quick waypoints for you. If we look out here, the very first one in blue up here, we see uh, a dip in temperature. That's me opening up the top of my smoker or the bottom actually, and putting in um, some hickory, right? I like hickory to start with. Um, and then again here, this is me opening up. The second waypoint is me opening up and adding some um, uh, oak, right? I like a good base oak flavor. Um, and right down here, this third spot is where I'm actually taking off that second pork butt um, and wrapping it. This is where I'm doing the wrap. But I waited, if you noticed, I waited almost three and a half uh, hours to do that. And the reason I did that was to let the smoky flavor penetrate into the meat and then wrap it and let it go. And sure enough, it gets to, you know, 190 degrees at about 2 a.m. So I pull that meat off. If I hadn't, if I had left it on, it would continue to go up this direction and cap 200. When you get over that 200 degrees, something strange happens to your meat and it goes from moist to mushy and you don't really want that. So I actually did take this off and put it in my oven in the house for another hour to let those fats render that we talked about earlier. So a good bit of work and so we could see graphs and we're talking about data in this um, but there's a little bit more going on to this so we're so I wanted to share that with you um, as we move forward the other thing I noticed my IOT device did was it has an API and it gives off not just temperature readings but it also gives off the fan that, and that's what these, uh, this green series of data is, right? So that green is how fast or what percentage of the total speed the fan is running at. So in the far right of the screen, it's running at 100%. Somewhere down at the bottom, it's running at 0%. And you can see that each time I open the lid, the fan goes up trying to keep the temperature to, to stabilize the temperature. And what I was looking for was how can I predict refuel times, right? Well, it turns out that this area right down here, how long this fan is running, if you look at this, this kind of area under a curve, right? This area here, that ends up being a pretty good predictor that you're running out of fuel. And that's exactly what happened. Right around 1.30, I'm running out of fuel. I get up, add more fuel, and it turns out this meat is ready to go, so I pull it off. But at the same time, I added more fuel. Well, at that time, look at this. This happened. So my fire kind of got out of control. Too much air, too much oxygen, and that uh, caused that temperature spike. You also notice during that time, the fan wasn't running at all. It knew it was too hot. And then I can see again, again, that same area under the curve here happening here, a really good predictor. It turns out I'm out of fuel another six hours later. Um, but fortunate for me, I'm just gonna take the meat off. I'm not gonna add more fuel. So it turns out that I think going forward, Predicting refuel times is about this area under the curve. If I can identify those, then we can identify uh, and predict that refuel time. So I'll talk a little bit about how this correlates to what we do, because you guys are probably going, he's talking about barbecue. I haven't really heard anything about data at the moment, but I want to correlate this a little bit to um, the work that we do every day as technologists. Right? And we think about some things like, is it artificial intelligence or is it augmented intelligence? And so I would ask you to uh, take a moment and think about say the car you drive. A lot of us may drive a more modern car that gives us 
lane change detection, or it, it might park itself. Um, it may even um, give you like automatic braking, right? But it's not fully driving the car itself. That's on the artificial intelligence side, but it's augmenting our ability. So I think that's what I was looking for here was that can we augment the, in, the intelligence that it takes to make barbecue? The other thing that is correlates to is enterprise tools matter. This was, I don't wanna say an easy task to do, but it was made so much easier by having a tool like Snowflake, by having a quality tool like Sigma to do the um, analytics and the visualizations. Um, by having additional tools um, like weather source and the marketing, uh, the, the marketplace within Snowflake, right? To be able to just pull in weather data, which I used in this analysis, to pull in that weather data without doing any ETL, without doing any extra heavy lifting. It's a few clicks of the button um, and I have weather data and it's able to be joined directly into my uh, Snowflake database. The other thing I'll say here is um, just as with your work every day, collaboration is key. And I mean, um, I want to thank uh, Randy Pitcher. Um, we, he helped me tremendously on pulling this off. He helped me with uh, some of the task and streams work I did. And he, he actually advised me against it, saying, Sonny, this is probably not a good use case for it. You're over-engineering it. Here's what I would do. He helped me with some of the JSON um, parsing and some of the lateral flattening work. So uh, I want to say thanks to him and everyone in the community. So that piece, again, collaboration is, is so very important to what we do every day. Understanding the problem domain, this probably should have been the very first bullet on this slide, right? So when we look at this, all this, this presentation I've been talking to you about is understanding the problem domain. I know this audience is full of smart technical people and they can figure out the technical side of it. And it's usually like that at your company. So we really need to take a lot of effort to make sure we understand the problem domain. And there's a concept out there you guys may have heard of. It's called DITLOC, right? Day in the life of the customer. As an IT professional, uh, and leader, one of the things I encourage our teams to do is to embed technologists into the line of business. In agile processes, we take business leaders and we embed them into our agile development efforts, but sometimes we fail to take those same technologists and drop them into the business. Take that data engineer and have them sit on sales calls to see what customers are asking for or support calls to hear what customers are having trouble with or complaining about. Um, I, I once did a, a, a project for AAA of the Carolinas, right? AAA, uh, we, we basically rescue cars from the side of the road. So what did we do? We got up at 4.30 in the morning and we got in cars in trucks with truck drivers and went out to see how those members were experiencing uh, our service, and we were seeing how those truck drivers were utilizing our products. Makes a huge difference, and your engineers will create better solutions when they truly understand the problem domain. This whole presentation was really about understanding the problem domain. Um, automation is your friend. Uh, I thought Dan did a great job in talking about ETL. Um, if you guys had a chance to see his session, uh, Randy Pitcher, uh, really is a, has been very helpful with DBT. Um, I'm excited to add DBT to my uh, barbecue meets data efforts. I haven't done it yet, um, but Randy can count on me, you know, tapping on his shoulder for a little help and guidance with DBT. The other thing I would say is um, think cloud first. If you notice everything we did here, I did here today is all cloud-based from an IoT device, to uh, Sigma, to marketplace data, to Snowflake. So I would encourage you to think cloud first um, as you move forward. And, and maybe that's common knowledge by now. 
Again, a couple of quick technologies that I used in this process, Snowpipe and Copy Into for data ingest. Um, the marketplace used weather source data. Um, while I linked all of that in, I didn't get to the, I did some exploratory data analysis. I haven't gotten to the prediction piece, but stay tuned, that'll be coming. Um, we saw some lateral flattens to manage the uh, JSON data that comes from our IoT devices and to query that. Sigma computing for BI analytics and visualization. Uh, the great thing about tools like Looker, Sigma computing, th those sorts of things, they can actually query that JSON directly, uh, flatten that piece out for you so you didn't actually have to do any ETL uh, or you didn't have to do these lateral flattens yourselves. And then as I mentioned earlier, DBT and Airflow are fast followers. So I thought I'd give you a quick look at the, um, the current uh, high level reference architecture, if you will. Um, on this side, our IoT device is actually sending in JSON documents to the collector. We're writing those to S3 uh, using Snowpipe or copy into, depending on the environment. Um, to ingest that data into our uh, Snowflake data platform. We're also using weather source. There may be marketing data here, weather source data here, right? And that's joined in with the JSON data that comes from our barbecue. Um, and then we use Sigma for the visualizations and the analytics. The thing I will say to be fair, are we doing this? Yes, we're actually doing this. Are we doing this? Yes. Am I using Snowpipe? Probably not. Did a little bit with it, but I don't really have it running. Um, it was so much easier in this small environment that, oops, I'm using, excuse me. It's so much easier in this small environment to just use copy into's. And so that piece is continuing to work. Probably have a little work to do on the Snowpipe side. Where did I go? I'm sorry, guys, I pressed the wrong button. Um, over here, um, yes, we're definitely doing data sharing. Um, I'm going to give myself just a half a check on the, the Snowflake data platform side in that the modeling piece that I'm doing is scripted, but it's not automated. So uh, again, here comes DBT. Um, when that piece comes, I'll give ourselves a full check. And then from an analytics side, we're doing all of that. So I think we're doing okay on time. I thought I would just give you a quick view of uh, what, what the data might look like coming in and what it looked like coming out. So on the left, the JSON you see here, the first thing is this array here, and it is an array of essentially temperature probes, right? So line two is a temperature probe and line 18 is a temperature probe. They tell me the degrees type. This is Fahrenheit for two. This is channel one. Here's the label. And, it had, and that object has two other arrays. This is temperatures right here. And we've got times, Unix times. So on the right hand side, we basically have a CTE to select out the data I'm interested in. And all I'm really doing is selecting the channel, the degrees, again, the, and the two arrays. And then what we do is we use these sections here, uh, lines nine through 16, to actually um, flatten this data out. So this select statement selects from the channel up above. And what we do, select from channel, but we also use this function, lateral flatten. And I think the most common challenges I see people asking about with Snowflake, are lateral flatten, streams and task, and probably window functions, right? Window functions across the board. Um, so what we do here with lateral flatten is we basically pass in that array and it's gonna be something like what's over here, right? So we're gonna pass that array in and lateral flatten essentially creates a virtual table for us. We'll call that table X. And then we'll use that as a reference up in our select list. So I select my channel, the, the degree type. I then say, hey, go to that X array 
and dereference the array with x in the index and give me the value. So that's going to give me this value right there, or it's going to give me this value right down here. And I'll do the same thing here. I'll say, hey, go to the y array, which is my temperatures. Use that virtual table x. Take the index of that record and dereference it and give me the temperature. That's going to be this piece right here. It's really very simple. Um, a little bit unusual to say, hey, I've declared this thing down in the, uh, say, from statement and reference it back up in your uh, select list. So I think that's probably all I have for us today. Um, be on the lookout for me adding Airflow and DBT. I saw a lot of good questions. Uh, popping up through uh, the Q&A around that piece. Um, be on the lookout for weather source data to predict those refuel times and maybe integrate with something like SageMaker and Snowflake to model the data and run the predictions and then leveraging weather source data from the marketplace again and Google search terms to see who's cooking what and when across the country. So. I think a big takeaway for me here is to um, really talk about the value of this community. This really couldn't be done without all of the people on this call. Um, people like Randy Pitcher, glad to help, has a ton of knowledge. I know there are so many of us like this in the marketplace out there, so I would encourage all of you to get involved with your local uh, Snowflake community, um, go to those, um, those user meetings, give them feedback. If you want more detail, if you want more technical, if you want more business, but get involved and you will find so many people that want to help. Um, and then pretty soon you will be helping other people. So um, just wanna give a shout out to everybody and say, please join uh, the local community that's around you. And with that, I'll take any questions if we have any time. Well, um, we didn't get a bunch of questions, but I actually had a few questions too. And I'm actually gonna bring uh, Randy back on just for a moment here. Randy, hey, there he is. Um, and you actually answered, you mentioned lateral to flat and, and since we, we didn't have any other JSON content really on the talk, I was hoping you would go into it and you just answer that because I know that's a, that's one of my favorite things. And I know Randy enjoys dealing with that as well as the, the crazy things that you can actually do with JSON data and your example here of it's really, you're talking about dealing with IOT data and shared data and putting it all together into the platform to get your solution. Right. So, uh, Randy, I was kind of, you know, curious on, you know, you advised Sonny apparently to not use streams and tasks. Yeah. Uh, what was that all about? Yeah. So let's, let's, um, let's qualify that discussion. We have a half an hour each and I knew Sonny was going after me. So I advised him not to present streams and tasks. <laughs> ah. also, uh, also his use case is just super interesting where mine's a totally made up like pitch for my favorite Netflix show. It's not actually real. Um, so that's what that was. It wasn't necessarily like, Oh, Hey, Sonny, never use streams or tasks. I think this is actually a good use case for those. Um, as our materialized views, as our um, schedule, just tasks that do a copy, there's just so many options in Snowflake. So uh, that's what I meant by that. Okay. So All right. <laughs> I'll add to that then. And Randy, I will be tapping you to help me, make sure I have streams and tasks set up properly um, and along with our DBT implementation. So I'm really excited to collaborate with some other folks on the, um, in this community and actually to see, um, is it Stephanie? Is it, is it Stephanie Schilling that's going to be talking about marketplace today? Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, Stephanie will be, uh, will be talking about marketplace here in a little bit. Stephanie Stillman one of our product managers and that's going to be a little later she unfortunately is having a little technical difficulties so we're going to be switching the agenda around a little bit here in a minute uh but well, yes we are going to gonna, we're going to have a full full talk about uh about data marketplace and that's why i wanted to 
you know, bring that point up too, is you had that in your architecture that you were leveraging data from the marketplace um, as well as the data that you were pulling in from your, your smoker. Yeah. So Kent, let me add a little bit to this. So um, first of all, the data I showed today came from my own data from, from the, the, that I pulled off of my device, but I've gotten data from some of these, uh, vendors anonymized data that basically says, hey, here's all this temperature and cook data for thousands of cooks over the last few years. So that's what's going to feed my prediction models. Um, and what they're giving me is data down to the zip code and I have a date and time. Well, that works really great with weather source data because I have hourly data from weather source by zip code. So now I could join that particular hour and zip code together and say, hey, what was the temperature at 3 a.m. You know, in December when Randy was doing this particular cook, right? And how many hours in was it? Um, so we, we're gonna be able to do some, some of that analysis. Um, the folks at WeatherSource, again, when we talk about collaboration, Craig over at WeatherSource has been absolutely fabulous saying, hey, did you think about this? Here's what you could do with this. Um, so, collaborating not only with maybe your peers, but when you talk to experts in the field or you talk to vendors, they really give you insights in how to solve your problems that you may not be able to see. You know, you can't necessarily see the forest for the trees all the time. Yeah, that's, that, that's great advice too. I mean, it, it's great having you guys on here today and having all our, our data heroes here providing this feedback to the community. It, it's awesome and even though you you found a really fun way to present a, a very good use case because IoT is a big deal now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you you made it uh, very accessible for people to understand the value of it. Plus, uh, you know, I, I suspect you got quite a few of us. Anyone anyone who's not a vegetarian anyway was probably getting hungry listening to that first part of your talk anyhow. Um, who knows? You might have even converted a couple of, of vegetarians all, along the way. I will. Well, thank you for having me. I hope everyone enjoyed the talk. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. I was excited to be here. So thank you so much. It's not as technical as maybe some of the things that Randy has gone through and some of the other guests have gone through. But I think what it shows is the value, uh, the ease that you can do and, and selecting the right tools. And hopefully we highlighted some of the good attributes, the best attributes of getting to market quickly. Yeah, that's great. I think I think that's uh, something people really appreciate. So thank you again, Sonny. Thank you again, Randy. I'm sure we'll be talking again soon.